Psalm 84. How lovely is your dwelling place, Lord of armies. I long and yearn for the courts of the Lord. My heart and flesh cry out for the living God. Even a sparrow finds a home and a swallow, a nest for herself, where she places her young near your altars, Lord of hosts, my King and my God. How happy are those who reside in your house, who praise you continually. Happy are the people whose strength is in you, whose hearts are set on pilgrimage. As they pass through the valley of Baca, they make it a source of spring water. Even the autumn rain will cover it with blessing. They go from strength to strength. Each appears before God in Zion. Lord, God of armies, hear my prayer. Listen, God of Jacob. Consider our shield, God. Look on the face of your anointed one. Better a day in your courts than a thousand anyone anywhere else. I would rather stand at the threshold of my God than live in the tents of wicked people. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord gives grace and glory. He does not withhold the good from those who live with integrity. Happy is the person who trusts in you, Lord of hosts. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the truth that you love us as we've already heard and you've sent Christ because you love us as we've already heard and that our longing should and can be for you father please help me as I preach your word it is your word and so you have allowed an imperfect person to share about the perfect God of the universe in the perfect word that you've given us I pray I would be faithful to that please help us to hear what you want us to hear And help us to leave here loving you more than we did when we came. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. I just have a confession to make to begin with. Um, I have always struggled to read Psalms. I've read way more comic books, I mean that, in my life than I have poetry. Poetry is not really my thing. But for a few years I have uh, begun to take time each morning to read a psalm and then pray through it for a week. This has been refreshing for my prayer life. Well, about the time that we finally as a family decided we were coming to Rock Hill to be part of Pioneer Church, I reached Psalm 84 in that process, and I got stuck there. For about three months, I read and prayed through this psalm almost every day. And God used the psalm to teach me so much about himself. So in light of that, and all that's happened in the last eight months of us as a church called Pioneer, I want to take some time and walk with you through some of the things God's taught me from the song. My ultimate prayer is that some of the lessons I learned as I studied in this psalm can be used by us as a church to accomplish the work that God has for us. I think of Paul when he called the church in Ephesus to walk worthy of the calling you have received. That sums up what I hope for us as we look at the psalm today. Pioneers made up of people who are called by God. Do we really realize, amen, do we realize the weight and beauty of that statement? We are considered children of the God of the universe, but we are also a church. We are a spiritual nuclear family that is on display for Rock Hill and for the world to see. So how do we live worthy of the calling God has given us, both as individual children of God and as this pioneer family? Well, in order to live a life worthy of the call, I believe it begins with our desires, our longings. And the psalmist in Psalm 84 speaks to us about those desires. I mean, take a second to think about it. The human life is all about longings and desires, right? The very first people God created chose their own desires over God's. And what was the result? They had to go out of God's presence, out of a perfect garden. Their disobedience to God broke their relationship with Him. They began a journey that took them further from God, living for their own longings. But God didn't stop going to them. He reached out through Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Noah, Moses, Joshua. He had the Israelites create a tabernacle 
and later a temple as a place where he would come to meet with them. So you see, God desired to be with the people he created. But most people long for their own way over God's. Isn't that still true today? God reaches out to people and they continue to choose their own desires over his. A lot of times it's even true if we're honest, because I, I have to be honest, of his own children, his people. It's true of me sometimes, often. But we're supposed to be different. We should be longing for God. So today, let's allow the psalmist to answer three questions for us. First, how, sh how should we long for God? Second, why should we long for God? And third, where should we long for God? And by the way, I I'm a math teacher. I guess this is four questions. Just to warn you, there's a bonus question. But those three questions. So after each answer, I want to give you some exhortation as to how we can live out these answers to each question in our life as a church body. So let's look first at verses 1 and 2, and then also jump to verse 10 as we see kind of bookends that I think the psalmist is giving us to see how we should long for God. Verse 1, How lovely is your dwelling place, Lord of armies! I long and yearn for the courts of the Lord. My heart and flesh cry out for the living God. The writer begins the psalm by telling us how his longing is wholehearted. In ancient times, the Jewish people would go to the temple to worship God, and they would often travel great distances to get there. Why would they do that? Well, because the temple was where God met with man. You see, they should be longing to meet with God. That should have been their heart. When the writer states, how lovely is your dwelling place, a better translation is actually, I love your dwelling place. What is it that this man loves about the temple? He loves to meet with God. But in case we would miss how much he loved meeting with God, he continues by saying he longed and he yearned for the courts of the Lord. His heart and his flesh cried out to the living God. Think about that. His heart is all that's within him. And his flesh is all that's outside of him. He wants so badly to be with God that every part of him cries out. It seems kind of like he's lovesick to be with God. I remember during college working for a construction company for a summer. One 90 plus degree day. Because waterproofing hadn't been laid on a house properly. I was sent out to dig a trench about a shovel wide around the back of this house to figure out how deep the waterproofing or how short it was of being there. And then when I got there, I realized this. The place where I had to dig had a two-foot porch over it. And as I kept digging, I realized that it was about six feet short, which is kind of ironic. But I was digging this one-foot wide, uh, one wide ditch under a two-foot porch six feet deep. And as I began to dig, I realized that they probably wanted me to quit. I just kind of was like, I don't think they want me any here anymore. But there I was on my belly, digging a trench that was about one foot wide, six feet deep, two feet, under a two foot porch. And most of you, if you've known me for a little bit, you know that I almost always have a QT cup of tea in my hand. I thought it would be awkward to bring up here, so it's over there, okay? But you know that I love tea. I can't stand coffee, by the way, but I'll go to coffee with you. It's okay. I'll sit there and smile. Don't worry about it. I won't drink it, but I'll smile. When lunchtime came, I cannot ever remember wanting a glass of tea more than I did. Forty-ish years later, I still remember how much I wanted that glass of tea. In that moment, my desire for a big glass of tea was wholehearted. The writer here wants God the way I wanted that tea. Okay? He wanted to know how he knew how much he wanted God. So how should we long for God? With a whole heart, with a whole heart. But then jump down to verse 10. Better a day in your courts than a thousand anywhere else. I would rather stand at the threshold of the house of my God than to live in the tents of wicked people. You see, verse 10 gives us another how to loving God, and that is sacrificially. In that verse, the psalmist begins by saying he would trade a thousand days for one. Who would do that? He's willing to stand at the threshold. That's really, I'll be the doorkeeper in the house instead of being the occupant of another. Why would he do that? 
Well, let me give you another an example here. We all have a person we'd love to spend a day with, and we all have a place I would think we would love to go. And if you gave me the person and the place, I would love to be spend 24 hours with my wife, Kate, in Blowing Rock, North Carolina. I'm not asking for you to pay for me a trip. I'm just telling you, that's where I would want to be. I would be on cloud nine because I love her and I love the place. But if you gave us, what if you gave us an all expense paid one day trip to Blowing Rock, but I had to clean your house every day for three years in return? Or what if you told me, yeah, you can go to Blowing Rock, but for that day, you have to sweep the streets and clean the bathrooms. Would I want to go to Blowing Rock for a day badly enough that I would clean your house for three years? Do I long to be with Kate badly enough that I would be willing to clean the streets instead of eating at the nicest restaurant? By the way, yes to being with Kate, but I am I'm not cleaning your house for three years. Sorry. Okay? Ain't having. Um, actually, if you need it. If you need it by God's grace. There you go. The reason one is better than a thousand and being a doorkeeper is better than the occupant is who the time is spent with and who the position is given up for. The writer is willing to give up two of the most important things that human beings care about, time and position, so that he could be in God's presence. How does he long for God? Sacrificially. By sacrificing those important parts of human life, time and position. But then... The question is always, how does this connect to us? Well, the psalmist is talking about the temple, right? A place where he actually went. In our day, this is awesome. We have God's spirit dwelling in us. Each one of us is a temple. We don't have to go anywhere to be in God's presence. We have a front row seat to meet with God every moment of our day. So the question we have to ask ourselves is whether our desire to be with God and meet with him is wholehearted? Do we sacrifice what we want in our day for what God desires? If you don't have a personal desire for God that is wholehearted and sacrificial, you aren't alone. You are not alone. But we should desire to change our longings. We should have a desire to increase in those things. And what about Pioneer's spiritual life as a spiritual family? Do you realize that pioneer is the temple of God? What should that mean about how we think when we gather? More often than not, I spend way more time planning for that trip to Blowing Rock and being excited about that than I do about the gathering of God's people. Is that right? Is our preparation wholehearted and sacrificial when it comes to meeting with our brothers and sisters? You see, meeting with God's people, think about it, gives us a tiny glimpse into what it will look like when we reach God at the end of time. It's like a mini practice, imperfect example of standing in heaven. Do we realize that when we gather on Sunday morning or in journey groups or for Wednesday night prayer, that it is more beautiful, more wonderful, more amazing than the mountains or the beach or the lake? Now take a second, be honest with yourself. Does that seem silly to say? If so, why? Why would we feel that way? You see, our gathering here is preparing us for our gathering there. God is in heaven where our journey of life takes us. Do we long to be in God's presence at the end of time with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength? Do we ask God to reveal more of himself to us here so that our view of heaven increases. How can our hearts be transformed so that we have a wholehearted and sacrificial longing for God? Well, here's one answer. It's, it's sort of simple and sort of tough. We need to begin with prayer. We go to God and we ask him for a greater desire for him. We see this done by the psalmist. If you look real quickly at verse 8. Right in the middle of the psalm, where he longs and yearns for God, he prays that God would satisfy his longing. Lord God of armies, hear my prayer. This psalm is a prayer. You see, we need to get up each day and ask God to guide us to accomplish what he wants for us in our day. Begin by praying. And pray for each other to have this wholehearted and sacrificial love for God. This excited me to bring this up with y'all. Imagine if all of us at Pioneer began to pray 
this for everyone else in Pioneer. If you're thinking it's too much, you're like, what, Russ, what are you asking me to do? Consider this. There are eight pages for now, front and back, of members in our directory. That's about 12 people. What if you took a page a day and prayed for your brothers and sisters at Pioneer to have a desire for God that's all-encompassing and sacrificial? How long would it take? 10 minutes? Think of how powerful that 10 minutes could be for our church in accomplishing what God would have for us. And then think about it this way. Imagine if you had 50 or 60 people praying for you each week that you are longing and desiring for God more. I I personally think that's, that's really an awesome thing. So how should our longing for God look? It should be wholehearted and sacrificial. But let's look at our second question. Why should we long for God? Well, because, I'll give this one away quickly, of his character. Look at me with verses at verses 3 and 4. Even a sparrow finds a home and a swallow a nest for herself where she places her young near your altars, Lord of armies, my King and my God. How happy are those who reside in your house who praise you continually. Verse 3 calls God the Lord of armies. I love this name of God. The name is used four times in this psalm And there's a reason for that. He wants us to pay attention to that name. The name for God here is pointing out the fact that God is the leader over armies, throngs of angels. Think of it this way. The God of the Bible is a mighty warrior king. But hold on a second. When I think of all the mighty warrior kings that come to mind over the history of mankind, there are just not a lot I would want to hang out with. I mean, if I did something wrong, it's probably off of my head. If I couldn't make it at the construction company, I don't want to mess with a warrior king, right? So if this was all the writer had given us, it would make sense to question why anyone would ever want to be in his presence. But we can't overlook all of verse 3. You see, verse 3 tells us that the warrior king welcomes tiny birds to live and nest in his dwelling place. What do you do with that? Well, imagine you were a soldier in an ancient army going to war. You're one of the king's best warriors. So you're, li- you're with him, leading the troops. There's you and the king riding along. Throngs of older, other soldiers are all around you, and you're going into battle, step in step. Suddenly, your king stops his horse, and he climbs down, and he bends over. And what you're assuming is he's prepping for that last great speech to encourage the troops and lead you on to victory. However, as he stands back up, you notice something moving in his cradled hands. He calls you over, and you see a small bird with a broken wing. He speaks quietly to you. This little one is mine. I recognize it from my courts. Take it back to the castle and make sure that it's cared for. You start to bring an argument, but the warrior king looks you in the eye and says, Now, please. What would you think of the king in that moment? You see, the God of the Bible is the king of greatest might, but with the softest touch. Our God leads an army of angels, but he cares for the tiniest bird. Since he cares for the tiniest bird, of course he will care for us, brothers and sisters. That is the God the writer is describing, a king with infinite power and infinite compassion. You see, the God who is being written about is gentle, He's the gentle but mighty warrior king. He's all-powerful and he's all-loving, so he's worthy to be longed for. But then verses 11 and 12 give us more character traits of this gentle warrior king. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord gives grace and glory. He does not withhold the good from those who live with integrity. Happy is the person who trusts in you, Lord of hosts. God is a sun and shield. What does the sun do for us? It brings light, warmth, growth. When the writer calls God a sun, he is pointing to the fact that this gentle warrior king cares for us. What about a shield? The king also protects. Those who are his are cared for and safe in his hands. These verses also tell us that God gives grace and glory. Grace is unmerited blessing. 
It's a gift. It's something you didn't, get, you didn't do to get. But what about glory? Well, here, I think you think of it as unmerited honor. Remember earlier how the writer mentions he would be glad just to be at the door of God's courts. Being doorkeeper for God doesn't make you unimportant, guys. You're the doorkeeper for God. Anyone in God's courts are given glory because God gets all glory. Some of it falls on us. And then, just to make sure we don't miss how valuable it is to live for this God, verse 11 ends by telling us that God gives everything good to the person who walks with integrity. Those with a wholehearted and sacrificial longing for God, whose actions, thoughts, and words point to God, will be blessed with everything good, everything that God gives us. So the longing of the writer is to live in the presence of the gentle warrior king who cares and protects and gives grace and glory. But then take a second to look at verses 4 and 12. Why should we long for God? This one's pretty straightforward, because we will be happy. How happy are those who reside in your house, who praise you continually. Happy is the person who trusts in you, Lord of hosts. He drops these beatitudes in for us to enjoy. Those who live with and for God, who worship God, who trust with Him with their lives, are happy. Brothers and sisters, there is joy in the presence of the Lord. The character of God will lead us to happiness as we long for him. So then how should we, as pioneer, apply this to our lives? Let me ask us a few questions. Where do we fail to see God's character? Do we fail to recognize his might, that he can do anything? What about his gentleness? That's one that's a struggle for me at times. His care, his generosity, his faithfulness. If you are struggling with seeing God correctly in any of these areas, I again call you to pray. Ask God to show you his true character, and he will. It may not be on your timeline, but it will be at the right time. We need to pray for this correct understanding of his character, because when we fail to see God's character correctly, we will fail to desire him fully. See God as the gentle warrior king that he is, pouring out more blessings than we could ever imagine. But I want to throw out one other thing we need to do. We need to be a people of theology. Now, I understand that for some of you, I brought up a tough buzzword. The connotation of theology brings to some of our minds people who have had knowledge that puffed them up, but not love that built others up. However, I'm talking about everyday theology. I'm kind of coining that phrase. Theology is just the study of God. If you are someone who says, I don't need theology, I just love God, let me push back a little. Anyone here, whether you're a husband or not, I have in here who's a husband, but whether you're a husband or not, would you suggest to me saying the following statement of my wife is a good idea? I love you, so I don't need to learn anything else about you. If you would say that's a good statement, please touch base with me afterwards. But it's not a good idea, right? Because you can't love someone more deeply without knowing them. That's why we need everyday theology. You know where we find that? Here, in the Bible. That's why at Pioneer we preach the Bible and we teach the Bible and we discuss the Bible in journey groups and discipleship groups. Because the Bible gives us everyday theology so that we know God more, and in turn, we love him more. You know how I picked up these character traits of God from Psalm 84? This is really deep. You ready? I read it, and I thought about it. That, that's what I did. You see, everyday theology is how we know God more, as we read the word, and we think on the word, and we consider what God is saying about himself. So let's do that. Let's be, be people of everyday theology. And to our third question, where should we long for God? To answer that question, let's look at verses 5 through 7. Happy are the people whose strength is in you, whose hearts are set on pilgrimage. As they pass through the valley of Baca, they make it a source of spring water. Even the autumn rain will cover it with blessings. They go from strength to strength. Each appears before God in Zion. 
Well, here's the short answer to that question. Where should we long for God? Everywhere. We've already been told in verses 4 and 12 that happiness comes from being in God's presence. But look at what verse 5 tells us. God's people are happy as they lean on His strength. But the strength He has given us has a purpose. When the psalmist says, whose hearts are set on pilgrimage, remember that he's speaking of the pilgrimage that the Israelites would take to the temple. This was a tough trip. God provided His people with strength for the journey to get to Him. And happiness was the result. Think about it. For them, happiness on the road and happiness upon arrival. It didn't mean a lack of difficulty, but happiness. That is a good deal. But then look at verse 6. When I say I got stuck on Psalm 84, I really got stuck here. I love, I just love this verse. It's one of my favorite verses in the Bible. The valley of Baca is representative of a broken place. It could literally be translated valley of tears. But look at what God does here. Through his people, God provides water in this barren place. The dry valley of tears becomes a place with water coming from the ground and from the sky. As God's people traveled into hard places on their way to God's presence, everywhere they went was blessed. And then we get to verse 7, and we see a picture of that journey being step by step. This makes me think of when Jesus said, don't worry about tomorrow, because tomorrow has enough worries of its own. Or, in the words of the great theologian Dory, just keep swimming, just keep swimming, just keep, just keep, just keep swimming. God gives us what we need when we need it. But he doesn't promise the strength ahead of time. What we do see as a promise is at the end of the verse. God tells us that those who long for God along the way will get to him. Although the journey looks different for us, the concept is the same. As we live for God everywhere, he will bring strength for us in the journey. If we're going to God, he has promised he will give us the strength excuse me, the strength to get there. No one who is his will fall from his hands. Rest in that today. But one last thing from those verses. In verse 6, the pronoun used is they. The implication here is that those ancient travelers didn't walk alone, and neither should we. So, what are some ways that God would have us as a church be strength for one another as we walk with worthy of God everywhere. Well, here's a few. First, we should remember what he has done and remind each other of those things. So remember and remind. We forget so easily God's goodness, and we need to think about what he has done. As we sit here about eight months after Pioneer's beginning, let's remember what God has done. Here are a few remembrances of God's faithfulness that I jotted down. God provided a building to be able to begin Pioneer at relatively minimal cost to us. Coming from a church that's 14 years old without a building, that is a blessing. Believe it. In spite of faulty AC units, ongoing building projects, and rogue squirrels, we have been blessed to keep meeting as a congregation. I did feel led to tell you, if you're scared by the rogue squirrel, it was not in here. You're okay, okay? Don't fear. We have already seen many people baptized and coming to faith and growing in their faith. We've been able to partner with churches, both in the U.S. and abroad, to spread the gospel beyond Rock Hill. We've been able to talk with many of our neighbors, and we've begun to create relationships and connections in the, in the surrounding community for the purpose of spreading the gospel. Let me ask you this. What if taking time to remember and remind was just a regular practice when we met as journey groups? What if it was just commonplace when we get together in any setting? What if our prayers of thanksgiving just always included, we remember you did this, God. God gives strength as we remember and remind each other of his goodness along the road towards our God. But second, we need to call out and carry. If you're having a tough time keeping up, call out to someone. 
If we were walking down one of those ancient roads and I could see you limping, I could do something. I could say, what are we going to do here? But what about right now? Are there those of us hiding hurts right now? What about hidden sin struggles? What about those of us in a room like this, I would assume it would be somebody, who are thinking of walking away from the faith altogether? That could be true of some of you here. I know it's hard to open up, and I do understand rejection is possible. But find someone and call out for help. The church is a strength God has given us to complete the journey. I can attest to that fact by my own life. But we are also to carry. Brothers and sisters, when one hurting comes, don't look at them and tell them, just catch up, just catch up. Don't sigh and walk back with a look of frustration. We are all broken. I've thought about my own life and how I even do that with my own children at times. Be patient. When we act in those negative ways, we have forgotten our brokenness and it's revealing itself in our very actions. God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. So living out our longing for God everywhere includes doing so in the church. We need to remember and remind and ask and carry. But what I love even more is that the strength God gives us on the, along the way spills over to bless those around us, even if they aren't going the same way. As we walk through the valley, all around us springs up life-giving water, and others are blessed by it. We should literally get up each morning. What if we did this? Myself included. Thinking, how can I be a spring of life today? If you're at home with your children, how will you be a spring of life? If you're engaging with your parents, how will you be a spring of life? When you talk with your neighbor, how will you be a spring of life? At work, at the store, at QT, mainly for me, how will you be a spring of life? As you go down the road towards God, towards his kingdom, look and see who he places in your path to go to and to be a spring of life to. Maybe they will join you in the journey. But what specific place does God want you to go to so you can be used as a spring of life? We can too often scratch an option from the list because we don't feel led somewhere. I don't want to make light of feel led. But I will say this. Have we ever stopped to think about this? I don't ever feel led to go to the dentist or to exercise or to eat broccoli. Actually, I like broccoli. But the other two, I never feel led to do. But that doesn't mean it isn't what I should do. Instead, what if we looked at the skills that God has given us and then went to serve? Can you work rem remotely? Then maybe God would want you to go and help a church plant beyond Rock Hill. I almost scratched that sentence since we're only eight months old, but it's okay. Okay? Tao's going and that's good. How often do we choose not to step out because somewhere God tells us to go or calls us to go isn't safe? Do you realize that you're no safer in your bed than in the middle of a war when you're in the warrior king's hands. But even if you stay in Rock Hill for the next 50 years, the nations are all around us. I haven't been here, been here long enough to be sure of this, but I would be willing to bet that Winthrop has a decent number of students from all around the world on campus. What if we befriended those people and pointed them to Christ? Do you know most people that come over from overseas to, to another country are never invited into the home of an American? See, we could be used to do that. God may not have us go to their country just to invite them into our house for a meal. We have heard of rumors of refugee families possibly being placed in Rock Hill. What if we as a church were able to reach them for the gospel? You see, when the church is a spring of life, Longing and living for him everywhere, it is shocking to the outside world. Let me give you this example, and you don't know him, but my father-in-law is a wonderful man. But he would tell you he is not a Christ follower. On more than one occasion, though, he's told me that he sees our former church, Redeemer, function like a family. And I see much of that here at Pioneer as well, and I'm grateful for it. But here's things that happen. On more than one occasion, he's told me that he sees us like a family because of this. 
We moved their furniture. They fixed his lights. They came in in droves to Jonathan's first birthday party. I mean, I'm telling you, the whole yard was full of people. They brought meals when my mother-in-law was diagnosed with cancer. He has seen God's local family serve us and serve him, even when it meant time and effort sacrifice that they could be giving for something else. He's seen them as a spring of life. I still believe and pray, we pray every night, that Redeemer's witness that was shown to j would lead to his salvation. Where are those opportunities, though, for us in Pioneer? So the psalmist has told us how, why, and where we should long for God. However, there is one question, the last question, that we still need to answer. Who allows us to get to God? Believe me when I say we save the best answer for last, and we've already talked about it. Let's look at verses 8 and 9. Lord God of armies, hear my prayer. Listen, God of Jacob. Consider our shield, God. Look on the face of your anointed one. We've already looked at the fact that the writer prayed. But as he approaches God, look at who he bases his prayer on. He points to Jacob, reminding God that he is part of God's chosen people. Then he calls God to look at his anointed one, reminding him of the fact that he can come to God because he's a servant of God's chosen king. You see, our longing for God will not get us to God unless... We know who allows us to come to God. We need the offspring of Jacob, who is also the chosen king. Hundreds of years after this psalm was written, God sent his son, Jesus, in the line of Jacob as a man to earth. Jesus' longing for God was wholehearted. The Bible says that zeal for God's house consumed him. Jesus was constantly going into desolate places, just to dwell with God and pray to his Father. Jesus longed to be with God the Father with his whole heart, so he sacrificed time and position to be with God while on earth, and he sacrificed the same things to be with his people. Jesus showed us what it should be like to live a wholehearted and sacrificial life for God and for his people. Because of Jesus, we can now truly have a longing for God that is wholehearted and sacrificial. But there's more. Jesus said, I am gentle and lowly in heart. He is the man who allows us to enter into God's presence. He's more, though. He is God come to earth. Jesus is the Lion of Judah, a powerful and mighty king. He is also a lamb, meek and gentle. Jesus, God made man, is the mighty but gentle warrior king who reflects perfectly the care, protection, grace, and glory of God. But this is really important. Jesus walked this earth towards the temple in Jerusalem, towards the place where God dwells, just like so many Israelites before him. But do you know why he walked towards the temple? So he could die for us. We deserve to die because of our disobedience to God. But God showed his love for us by sending Jesus to die in our place. If we long to be with God, we need Jesus to be the one who dies in our place. But he didn't just die, right? He overcame death and he rose again so we could live for God and with God. Jesus said, I am the way, the way to God. Getting to God requires us going through King Jesus and continually walking with King Jesus. When we begin to walk in our own power, we won't make it. Brothers and sisters, don't try to do this on your own. Remember the offspring of Jacob, the anointed one, the King, Jesus, who will bring us to our destination. Friend, if you're sitting here and you're longing today, to get to God, but you haven't gotten there. I've got good news, best news you'll ever hear. Jesus is the way to God. Jesus stands with open arms and welcomes you to be part of his kingdom, to turn to him today. Feel free to come to me, Trell, 
Brogan, or any other member of this church to ask what it looks like to live a life of longing for this gentle warrior king. As we close, imagine for a minute those ancient travelers headed towards Jerusalem, headed towards the temple that we read about in Psalm 84. You see them walking. I think I see, I think I see Jerusalem. Is, is it that speck on the hill? And then a few days later, Daddy, Daddy, is, what's that bright reflection? Maybe that's the Temple Mount. Closer and closer they come. And they would arrive weary and worn and look on the beauty of the Temple. They would be in the place where God dwells. Do you realize it's the same with us? Our longing for God should grow as we pray and grow in everyday theology, as we long for God everywhere, leaning on the power and strength we gain from our King, Jesus. We will be a reflection of God to one another and to the world around us. As we journey towards Him, we will see His greatness and glory more clearly until we reach Him. Pioneer, we're eight months old. In the next five, 10, 20 years, will we grow to live more worthy of Him? We will if we're longing to get to Him. Since those first people left the garden and chose their own way, we have all been going somewhere. We've all been longing for something. But because of Jesus, we can one day walk back into the garden. And all of our greatest longings will be fulfilled in Him, the gentle warrior King. The valley of tears will be behind us. We will be with God the Father, Son, and Spirit, our perfect rest and joy in heaven. Is that our deepest longing? I pray that it's so. Let's live and long for God, pioneer so that we will grow to be more and more worthy of our calling in the days and years to come. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your grace to us. Thank you for Jesus. Jesus, thank you that you died on the cross so we could be made right with God. Father, we thank you that you have given us everything if we've trusted in you. You've given us life. You've given us strength for the journey, and you promise us heaven. We're grateful for that. I pray right now for any of those who don't know you, who do not understand what it is to walk with you, that they would understand that even today, that you would, today would be the day of their salvation. And I pray for us as brothers and sisters in Christ at Pioneer that we would be faithful to love you and to serve you, to pray and to seek your face by the power that is given to us through Christ. Be glorified in our rest of our day, in the rest of our lives, and just be honored in all we do. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.